Today's market call is presented by FactSet, financial data and analytics powered by tomorrow. It's one o'clock on the East Coast. It's March 21st, Thursday. Rangers play tonight. Yeah, they do. Dan Nathan actually just said that Rangers Bruins at MSG. You don't look excited. The world's most famous. It is. You know what? It is the world's most. Hold on a second. By the way. Oh, you, you want to put just that putting right that right there. in the I, smack I metal. It is the world's most famous arena. Yeah. Uh, this is Market Call. Yeah. Typically on Thursdays, we're joined by Carter Braxtonworth. He's on spring break. Yes, he is. He's probably down in like Fort Lauderdale doing no, like beer be like, bombs. Like, 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 like uh, no? Palm Beach would be something. You think Palm Beach? Yeah, he's more of a Palm Beach than a Fort Lauderdale beer yeah. bomb guy. And that yeah. makes sense. Yeah. Uh, but we do have, if it's Thursday, bitch. Yes, it is. It's Butters. Yeah. So let's take a look at our rundown because we are once again off to the races. Regulatory smackdown on big tech. Well, it's actually just one big tech. Well, well, a little, we got a little couple. EU action. A little here EU, too, so yeah. That's the a, regulatory little, yeah. bodies across the pond. And it's interesting. Again, markets flying. Apple's not. So I yeah. guess the market doesn't need Apple, as I thought. It run down. Micron all time high amidst. That's my word, not yeah. yours. Is yeah. AI boom. Yeah. And we have a little earnings preview, FedEx and Nike. We're going to look at obviously some individual names as well as we go. Yeah, yeah, we will. I mean, there's a couple of really great questions um, from yesterday. And we tried uh, to, we efforted to answer yeah, all of them. We're going to follow up on a couple of those things. Um, I, I mean, let, let's just talk about the Apple. I mean, to your point here, um, you know, it's interesting that this stock, maybe they could pull up a day chart here. So this was kind of anticipated. It was uh, the Justice Department. So not the FTC, not the Federal Trade Commission. You and I talked about it a little bit on Fast Money last night as it was coming out. I mean, when you see these sorts of headlines, whether it's DOJ or FTC, it just makes all matters of their business that much more difficult like things that they might want to do in generative ai let's do a two-day chart really quickly here too um you know whatever it might be right it's Mm -hmm. just like there's greater scrutiny on it guy so this is kind of interesting you know it gapped up a couple days ago you know the thing was you know trading pretty well into the close yesterday the market was screaming into the close yesterday it's interesting that the stock only gapped down one percent on that headline but when i see a day chart like this and i look at what's going on in the s p 500 up 55 Five basis points or something like that that's real selling in a stock of yeah. this size uh, without question i mean that is people picking out apple and selling it vis-a-vis the individual name not the etf not Correct. vis-a-vis the etfs which is another conversation for another time but we had the conversation on fast money last night and if we do a longer term chart you know we thought apple could trade down to like 164 165 it didn't get that low it yeah. got close you know, it violated the moving averages. And what I said last night was, you know, if people have been fortunate enough to catch the bounce off the level that we sort of put out, and I'm not suggesting people listen to us, by the way, but, you know, that level made sense. Well, it filled I, in that gap. I said, you know, what, yeah, level, what you're seeing yeah. here is like, you know, people just taking profits on a trade that's worked out so over the course of a couple Apple, weeks. Don't know. Well, I, I'm just, yes, actually, I am. It's but a that's for tradable for, stock. Now, You'll look at this, and I think you had the 50-day moving average up as well. So you might as well throw that bad boy in along with the 200-day because you know something interesting is happening here. We violated that moving average, clearly violated the 200-day moving average. It is flattening out. The 50-day now has crossed the 200-day moving average. So just keep that in mind. I think the last time that happened was on the upside probably a year and a half or so ago. So you don't see this type of situation all that often, but here we are. And there you go. Thank you, Amanda and or Jacob. When we crossed to the upside, you see the subsequent move. And the 50-day moving average, by the way, acted as a trend line, as Carter will often say. I mean, the trend line, the uptrend line is effectively that 50-day moving average. Just keep that in mind. Now the 50-day is crossed going the other way. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, if you say history repeats in terms of you saw it on the upside, you see it on the downside, you could start to sort of connect the dots and say, okay, maybe something has changed here. And again, I'm not a hater. I don't care one way or another about it. I really don't. I have their phones. I don't bow at the altar of Apple. I, I will never wait online for anything that they do. Mm-hmm. I will certainly not go to an event that they host, but that's me. I just want to put that out there. But these 
these formations, these chart patterns are important, Dan. Yeah, well, let's look at longer term ones. So let's back it out 12 years or so here. Let's go from the lows. And, you know, I think it was like 2012 or something like that. So there's obviously that chart that Guy was just talking about. You see where those support levels is. 166 or so was that October low. It looked like we we're almost going to get there just a couple of weeks ago. Um, again, you know, let, let's see how it acts in and around there. I just, unless there's some sort of proposed remedies, uh, you know what I mean? And this is not going to happen. This is going to take a long, long time, right? When the DOJ starts to look at this sort of stuff so you know really it's going to get back to trading on fundamentals soon enough we're getting towards quarter end look at this one this is a log chart this is going back to 2012 and it's interesting you see that long-term uptrend right and you see what's interesting and guy you mentioned this all the time this stock is not immune to having 30 or 40 percent you know peak to trough sort of declines and you see those series right of higher highs yeah. right and you see that it you know back in um the prior decade it bounced off that uptrend on numerous occasions and then it just exploded when it got to that kind of covid sort of low here we are we're breaking that five-year uptrend okay that goes back to about 2019 mm -hmm. or so and then if you see that uptrend that goes all the way back to the financial crisis you know that gets you back to 90 bucks i'm not saying it's ever going there but if you just think about it on a valuation basis if you think about it relative to their growth you think about it relative to their product roadmap and the things that investors are willing to pay 30 or 40 times for in this market, my, or Apple does not have it right now. So that's the only thing I would make the case from a fundamental standpoint, from a sentiment standpoint, and then obviously from a technical what standpoint. What is interesting about that is it seems improbable mm -hmm. that it could, it could come off in that magnitude, basically a 50% drawdown. You're yeah. like, there's no effing way yeah. this could happen. Yet if you go back and look, at this chart, as a matter of fact, it actually has happened. As you said, we've seen 35 to 50 percent peak to trough declines in this name. And again, you know, we're just pointing it out just so you can see it. It's just we can we can talk all we want. But when you see it on a chart like this, it goes back 12 years. You can actually see these peak to trough declines we're talking about. So. Just take that yeah. for, uh, with a grain of salt Let, there, people, because it's happened before. It's happened. Let's go back to the prior chart for a second. So just that one year. And if you were to look from the all-time high that was made in late December, and let's just say you want to go back to 160, right? Like back near those kind of lows from uh, late March of last year. So one year. You know, that's a 20% peak to trough decline. And, you know, there's other stocks. I mean, we're talking about AMD yesterday, which is, you know, seemingly a mm -hmm. great story. That's down 20%. It can't even get going um, in a day like today. So we just bring that up because, uh, again, lots of folks, and you and I mistakenly thought that, you know, when you have a $3 trillion market cap company down 13, 14% as the S&P and NASDAQ's making new all-time highs, sooner or later, that's going to have implications on other parts of the index. A hundred percent. I mean, I, I've said it and I'll say it again. You know, if you had told me how Apple had traded down to that level, the bounce, and then the subsequent self we're seeing now and say, okay, tell me where, what's going to be happening yeah. in the S&P. I'm like, I, I would have been a hundred percent. I mean, I could not have yeah. been more wrong because you would have thought just the map would suggest it would have drawn the, big, the broader market down with it. And it clearly hasn't happened. You know, it's interesting. I had a great conversation yesterday with Josh Brown and Mike Batnick. The TRB. The, the TRB, downtown Josh Brown and Michael Batnick. Um, and they, uh, you know, check check it out. It's in the On The Tape podcast store dropped this morning. And they pushed back on, on me on a, on a bunch of stuff because we were talking about, like, let's say NVIDIA. We we're talking about narratives. And, you know, we, we talked a little bit about the EV narrative. We talked, uh, you know, about the Apple and the smartphone and the ecosystem and this and whatever. And, you know, the fact that those companies uh, the stocks have underperformed you know as the like you could say well then that throws anything that you want to say about nvidia coming undone the difference with nvidia let's just pull up nvidia here for a second here is that you know, this is something that is rising tide is listening, lifting most boats. Right Clearly. Now. And we don't have to get into AMD and some of the other ones that have not had good results of late. Look at like a Broadcom today. You know, we mentioned that since they reported, um, you know, the stock hadn't seen an uptick until today after Micron's earnings. Right. So look at that. It's like having up seven mm -hmm. or eight percent or so. So my point is, is that it's dragging up a lot of competitors. It's dra dragging up people that are in this kind of uh, vertical. They're dragging up, you know, people who are assembling the boxes people who are the data centers people like the list goes on and on so to me this is a much more integrated sort of thing and then it goes back to micron guy do you want to comment on this because we we previewed it yesterday this is obviously one of the most cyclical areas within the semiconductor business this is obviously memory
memory. They're talking about tremendous demand for their memory that's linked towards, you know, these um, mm -hmm. high end graphics processors that it takes to do all this stuff. Let's back the chart out a little bit. There's obviously a, a breakout on a multi year basis. And then we have a longer term one. Look at that. It's kind of it's a good looking breakout guy. Talk to you me. talked about it and we can go farther back than that. I yeah, mean, you go one. back to. Yeah. I mean, that goes back to 2000 and you can see where we are. And you actually thought last night that this set up really well for a breakout to the upside. That proved to be the case. So let's talk about it already today. I think the stock has traded 60 million shares. You could pull it up on your fact set machine. I think it typically trades about 15. So we're on course to trade. I don't know, maybe seven, eight, nine times normal volume on this gap higher on what was a very good report. No question about it. But, you know, like other things, you know, is this an exhaustive pattern? Or is this the beginning of a bigger breakout? That's something you have to determine. Go back to NVIDIA real quick, because I do think this is interesting. Tomorrow will be uh, the third Friday. So it was Friday, Friday, and this fr tomorrow will be the yeah. third. I mentioned that because two Fridays ago, tomorrow will be three. You had that engulfing pattern in NVIDIA that we've talked about a number of times. By the way, it has not been violated at all. I mean, all we've done effectively is chop sideways. That engulfing pattern that we talked about where you had an all-time high, a subsequent move below the prior day's low, mm -hmm. closed below it on huge volume, that is still intact. People want to forget about it for obvious reasons, I understand, but the technical formation is still there. Now, if we sort of ratchet through a 1,000 and off, to, okay, then we'll have a much different conversation. But what I'll tell you now is, when you see a pattern like that, you take notice and nothing's changed that suggests that pattern has been violated in any way. That pattern is still in place and that pattern is a bearish one. Yeah, Dan. so leaving this chart up really quickly. So you see that gap up after its earnings about you know a month ago, it was February 22nd or so. And then you see that nice little rise um, until you got that big reversal day. Okay, so almost three weeks ago or so. It's a really nice consolidation, especially when you consider the fact that there was a lot of anticipation about this GTC event that we had mm -hmm. earlier in the week. Lots of great announcements. It gave a lot of bulls a lot more confidence about the guidance that the company he had just given a month ago and the like here but it's interesting that the stock remains range bound so again one of the things that i thought was really interesting about my conversation with josh and mike is that talking about this ai narrative and and again we can all agree that this is like a technology that's going to transform you know obviously technology and almost every other industry it's going to take some time a lot of pull forward right here but there's a lot of other names that are being attributed to this thing rather than just the ev story and the tit for tat as far as it goes with ice and, and the like here and then you could also throw the apple scenario in there too apple go down 50 percent from here and if the market's broadening out then it could continue to go higher right it's just it's just different i just think there's so much stuff wrapped up into this ai trend right listen and i think I'm going to listen to that conversation, and I'm sure that's what you discussed. But yeah, clearly, the the where the AI revolution it's taking place at the exact right time for the broader market, right? Vis a vis the lens we're looking at in terms of Apple, without question. And it, you know, again, we'll see how it plays itself out. I mean, the bond market is something that I just want to address today. Now, you obviously got the dovish commentary. You're not necessarily seeing it in ten-year yields, which are. I think about 4.27%. It's not like it came off dramatically. That's something to watch. Um, I just throw that out there. But today is, again, you know, this levitation continues, Dan, on, in funny. terms of the S&P. I would have thought, Guy, and I think we were talking about with Liz yesterday, I would have thought that, you know, the reaction we would have seen first to whatever commentary was going to be was in the yield, you know, Treasury yields. And it's just fascinating that it's just stuck right here, 428, mm -hmm. 427, or something like that. So um, agreed. I don't know what, it, by the way, and I, I'm not going to tell you, I know what it means, but. It is stuck right here. Yeah. So we'll see. Hey, I just want to let's pull up that long term micron chart before we get out of here on the tech stuff. Um, this to me was pretty fascinating because we had spent some time talking about like that prior double top and its ability to kind of get back through there. And when you look at this on a log basis, you just look at that kind of uptrend that it's been in. You see the sort of volatility that we've had off of those lows over the last call it 15 years or so. But here we are, man, like getting up above that prior all time high. It's a different company, it's a different tech market it's a different you know what i mean like there's a whole host of different things going on right now so i just said it people it is different this time but that is a constructive breakout yeah. so i guess my point is if it can hold that thing 
um, and you believe in the secular trend, like this is the sort of thing that you want to buy. Maybe it's not the sort of thing that you want to kind of chase an NVIDIA for, but you look and see how does this trade broaden out to other players? And that's a conversation, by the way, and another good one with uh, Gene Munster of Deepwater Asset Management on OK Computer that dropped on Wednesday. We talked about his belief in this kind of AI paradigm shift not a wave and he's not playing it through nvidia so tune into that he's playing it some other ways i thought that was really interesting it was interesting because i listened to it i was off set as they say but yeah. i was listening and he said they're actually not in nvidia yes they're very bullish the early innings in ai but nvidia is not a name they're currently in so you should definitely go to your favorite podcast store and listen okay no because it was very good it was good thank you i appreciate it um one last thing on tech before we get out of here i'm, I'm having a conversation with a woman named joanna mcfarland she is the ceo co-founder of hop skip drive this is a company that is basically a ride share company but it deals for it's basically for children and they contract with schools they contract with organizations to get very very vetted drivers okay helping kids get around they could be kids in foster care they could be underprivileged kids. they could be in organizations that are trying to help you you know, like all sorts of use and stuff like that. And it was really interesting. It's a model that's not too different than Uber and Lyft. And it got me thinking about it, got me looking at Lyft because we we're talking about their financials. I'm not going to share them here, but um, it was just kind of interesting. They look a lot better than Lyft's. Look at what Lyft's been doing. Do you remember when they gave that guidance guy? What's your typo? acronym? Um, mine is Zebra. Oh, so Lyft last is year edit. it was in the TLSQ. Yeah, 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 yeah. All right. But, but look at what Lyft is doing. Okay. So this is the chart since it went public. Okay. But look at this thing. It, it, when it gapped down, this was, um, you know, in 2022 to those new all time lows, look at how much time it spent in that kind of high single digits to the high teens. And now it's kind of pressing up. I just think that's kind of interesting because well, they did beat and guide higher. And it looks like the story is kind of changing Car a little bit. And Carter's, then they, they want to bring up Uber. Like, like well, let's Uber. leave Lyft up yeah. here for a second because Uber's a whole yeah. another yeah. story. And that's one of the reasons the transports and you know the IYT and some of these yeah. other, I mean, that done so well. Double top potentially but done so well. If Carter were here, he would say we're at the beginning of a bearish to bullish reversal yeah. without question. So if you can get a close above like 22, I think the level is ish. You know, then all of a sudden this thing's gonna look really interesting. So the question is, do you buy it here and hope it does that, or do you buy it on the breakout? I think, listen, depends it's a stylistic thing. Yeah. But I mean, it's clearly, I think, in this sort of basing formation, and it's clearly starting to peak its setup. Now throw up Uber because obviously that's a completely different chart in terms of how it looks. Yeah. I mean, that's lower left, upper right, and you can see that as clear as day. So even if Lyft were just to play catch up, uh, you can see a decent little move. I mean, a 20% move in Lyft from this point is not all that much. You know, you take it from 20 to sort of 24 and a half, 25. Uber is a $168 billion market cap company. Um, it is trading at about 60 times this year's earnings, a little less than four times sales, and they have gross margins. Again, this is one of the knocks on this company at 40 so percent. I just want to bring up Lyft for a second because this is kind of interesting. And when we think about this, this is a company that has uh, margins in and around the same spot, actually higher, right? So one of the knocks on um, Uber, when they were going into delivery and, and all that sort of stuff, is that the unit economics are not particularly good mm -hmm. there. But when I look at a company like Lyft, it has an $8 billion market cap. They have uh, an enterprise value that's about seven and a half. So they have $1.7 billion in cash and they have a billion dollars in debt. So you say to yourself, man, if this company has better margins than Uber, there's a couple things that they can do to kind of gain some market share and, and do it in a profitable sort of manner. This stock could be off to the races. That was one reason why I had it last year in my fast money acronym, because I thought that this thing, you know, is a, a perfect takeout candidate when you think about the size of it and the balance sheet. Model. Year early, perhaps, yeah. but the premise was probably correct without question. You wanted to mention Goldman Sachs, which today made a 52 week high yeah. and it was within earshot, I believe, of the all time there. high we saw in the fall of 2021. If you want to put a longer term chart up. So we had a question yesterday. Why is Goldman Sachs underperforming? And I think we addressed it. Um, we said, you know, vis-a-vis -vis JP Morgan, yes. Vis-a-vis uh, -vis Morgan Stanley, it's been right there. But here we are. And I will tell you, you know, we, those little lows that we saw, if you go back and look, you can, if Amanda can draw a horizontal line around those lows, you know, we pointed out a long time ago the potential that we held those prior lows. Now, again, here we are at all-time highs. I didn't think that was going to happen. I thought we would bounce, and we did. But now here we are. So the question is, do you stay with this or is this the day that it exhausts itself? And 
you know, again, that's for you to decide, but you can see the levels as clear as day right there. Yeah. So let's go back to that other chart for a second, too. Um, I think it's interesting that, again, we have Reddit it just opened up $20. The deal was priced at $34. It's trading about $55 right here. And almost everybody and their mother was on that. But look at that. We were talking about that consolidation, mm -hmm. right? It was pretty interesting. And so why do we look at charts? Because, like, you know, either this thing was going to remain range bound and then sooner or later was going to test that lower bound, or you get a day like today where everyone's feeling great with all time highs, IPOs. There was that um, Altera Labs yesterday. Now we have Reddit. There's a bunch of others here. Goldman are going to be in on this. Rather than buying this breakout right here, I'd look at Morgan Stanley maybe. And so, like, look at this chart here. So, again, this is interesting to me because for a whole host of reasons, I think these guys are positioned very similarly in the investment banking. It's just breaking that downtrend that's been in place from those 2021 highs and you see there's some room to run here mm -hmm. with the goldman you got to be pressing on the fact that it's going to be a runaway breakout above those prior highs i like the idea of trading something like this getting it back towards those previous highs not that i'm a fan of pair trades yeah. and i'll tell this quick anecdotal story eric mindich was the youngest at the time was the youngest partner in the history of goldman mm -hmm. sachs you can look him up and check it out and he was at the equities division and Lloyd Blankfein strolled over one day and was talking to Eric Mindich about the different positions mm -hmm. they had on. And Eric was saying, we're long this, short that, blah, blah, blah. And he, you know, he spoke for a few minutes and Lloyd, as only Lloyd could do, said, well, how do you know what you're rooting for? Mm -hmm. Which sounds like, but if you think about it, so pairs trades are, if you're long something and short something, what are you rooting for? Yeah. I mean, you're rooting for one to go up and one to go down, but you're making a bet. So I'm not I'm not saying you should sell Goldman buy Morgan Stanley here, yeah. but if you do, do believe that they are very similar and there's going to be a bit of a catch up here, clearly the catch up trades in the form of Morgan Stanley. Yeah, and the flip side of that is like the money center banks. I mean, look at like we've highlighted this JP Morgan's up 17% on the year and if you look at a Morgan Stanley, it's unchanged on the year. So at some point there will be either JP Morgan's going to come back, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Or Morgan Stanley's going to play catch up if m &A picks up, if the deal calendar picks up and the like here. So Morgan Stanley to me is probably the most attractive looking name in the entire um, you know financial space, whether you're looking at money centers, investment banks, um, a whole host of other sorts of names. So you know maybe we'll trade that one guy when we do a, like an options trade. Really Speaking of trades, I mean, let's pull up Boeing real quick because Ooh, yeah. what's today? Thursday. Yeah. So Tuesday... We outlined a trade um, in in Boeing vis-a-vis -vis calls. You outlined a pretty yeah. interesting um, well. First strategy. of all, let, let's just be clear. You were looking at the fundamentals. You were looking at the news flow. You were considering the sentiment. You were considering the technicals. People ask us all the time, how do we come up with the inputs for a trade idea? Well, that was it. And we laid them all out there. And I said, basically, if you agree with Guy on all those sorts of things, you probably want to define your risk. Because pull this out to a five or a 10. You yeah. remember that one? We were like, listen, if you get it wrong, and there's lots of tape bombs in this thing right oh, it's now. 165, you, 17. You probably don't want to be long it, right? But we also talked about... We brought up risk reward, the potential yeah. to be, you know, we went through it. And if you didn't see it, I'm sure you can go back and, and find it on our risk reversal website. With that said, you know, look, I understand the broader market helped a great deal yesterday, but Boeing was on its horse earlier in the day yeah. as well. So it's one of those things like you, you're looking for inflection points, you're looking for levels. And I think we found it Now we might've been a day early ish, not that that matters, but pretty damn close and i think you stay with this so you know pull up that other boeing chart that we just had and you can see the levels that we outlined and you can see some of the room that it has i mean this thing could sort of levitate back up to the moving average nothing's been solved yeah the headline risk hasn't gone away but what you're saying is the market has figured it out right and the market has digested a lot of this stuff and you have sort of diminishing marginal returns in terms of what the news does to the downside of the stock. Yeah, and so just to be clear what we were kind of looking at, the stock was at 181. We identified that support level. We said you probably wanted to find your risk to that point here. So we looked at a call spread. We looked out a few months. It was June expiration. It was the 185, 220 call spread. That's not what I would be buying right now if you think that you want to kind of play this thing for a move back towards that 200 day or maybe higher or so. But we were risking $9 to possibly make uh, twenty six dollars. It was so a three like, to one. Yeah, we like we like the risk reward there. Right now, I might look at something that looks like the one ninety strike in targeting still maybe two twenty, two twenty five, or something like that to the upside. So again, I think it's interesting because we wanted to define our risk. We used all the inputs that guy was focused on. He wanted to take advantage of the negative sentiment, and it worked out at least in the near term here. So the idea is like we're gonna keep the keep an eye on this one, guy. No, you have to keep it, and we're just bringing it up just to bring it up. Yeah. And, you know, again, they're trading opportunity. You can have a 
negative thesis for in general, but you could be bullish on other things. And there have been other things that have been working. I mean, energy, I think, continues yep. to work. We don't have to get bogged down in there. That clearly is a story in terms of you know, the underlying commodity. But more specifically, what's going on in gasoline, which I don't think people fully realize. Typically, you're starting to see gasoline, peak gasoline coming into the summer. You're seeing it now in March. I mean, gas prices, futures contracts at least, are off to the races, as is copper and obviously as is gold. So we'll see how that plays out, which is one, of, by the way, which is, again, one of the reasons I was so surprised at how dovish uh, the Fed chair was yesterday. But that's another conversation for no doubt, time. especially with the dollar strength that we've seen, the fact that yields are not going down. much lower. I mean, it's just very interesting to me. All right. Before we get to butters, let's look at a couple of companies that are reporting after the close tonight. We kind of highlighted earlier in the week the implied moves. They haven't changed too much, but let's start with Nike here, guy. Implied move about seven and a half percent in either direction. And it is amazing to see. A company like this and the stock of a name brand sort of thing, look at that 200-day moving average. It's been basically moving lower for the last six or seven months or so. What has been going on since it started moving lower? Well, the market's been ripping, right? So this company, you know, obviously they had that run up um, into that last earnings report. They missed, they guided lower. At this point, uh, listen, I... <laughs> You can't press something like this in a market like this, right? No. I mean, so it's like it almost looks too easy to say, you know what? I'm just going to get along this thing. You know, maybe you do it with calls or call spreads to find your risk or so. But like, it's really, I, I, and maybe this is the sign of the top people, but like, I don't know how you look at a stock like this and say, okay, into a print, like, you know, like after a disappointing quarter last quarter with expectations low, how you don't just kind of take a shot in the lungs. The September low um, of last year is like 90 bucks ish. Let's just round it off. Mm -hmm. um, you see where we are now. So percentage wise, I mean, in terms of risk, I mean, that's a significant risk if you're long here, because I think that's sort of your level. But the flip side is, to your point, you know, you've seen some ridiculous moves to the upside in so many different stocks. I mean, you saw See, that's a tough one, because obviously there's a violation of that downtrend. Yeah. But whatever. I think, look, if you if you're in the mood where, you know what, the market is your friend right now and any semblance of good news gets stocks up five, six percent. It's worth taking a shot here on the long side, and I'm not. I don't know what necessarily they're going to say to sort of get people excited, but you now the fact that we've been going sideways here maybe suggests we're just getting set for another move like we saw off that again September low into early December. All right, here's the deal. So just just to give you a sense. The stock is at 101.77 right mm -hmm. now. I'm looking at the tomorrow expiration, and make no mistake about this, people. If you were buying one day options, okay, it's okay. You're gambling. Uh, buying it, you're, you were gambling, but this is how my mind works a little bit. I look at the 102 strike call that expires tomorrow. It's about three dollars and seventy five cents. Let's say I look up to the 112. So the 102. 112 call spread that's ten dollars wide i could sell the 112 call at 75 cents so this ten dollar wide at the money call spread costs three dollars it's about three percent right so that's what you're risking the implied move is seven and a half so if you got a seven and a half percent let's say if it's going to go seven and a half it's going to go ten percent let's be clear okay and so a ten percent move well, so, get you're right. so, so you right risk there. three to possibly make seven it's not a great risk reward, but if you were looking to play it, that's probably one way to do it. But again, like I said, if you were buying one day options into a binary potential event, you are gambling. You're probably, and again, I can't speak to the, the what your chances of success are. My sense is it's like a 25% chance of success and it's two and a half to one enough with the 25 I mean, that's sort of the math that yeah. has to go on. Well, what Ish. I do is like, so I would look if I were paying $3 for that $10 wide, okay, the 105s are basically at a 39 delta. So it's about a 40% probability that's, that's that higher than I thought that 105 oh, would be, would yeah. be um, in play. So tomorrow. I'm probably actually pretty close, You're but pretty, whatever. I mean, there close. you go. All right. Should we do one more then before we get to butters? Yeah. All right. Let's do FedEx because this is one that I think you'll find pretty interesting. You've been focused on the transports a little bit. Um, you know, this is looks not too different than what Nike looked like into their last print here. It had this huge run up to new 52 week highs off of like seemingly a, a 52 week low, huge gap lower, starting to fill in that gap a little bit. This though, guy, seems very different to me. Okay. So this thing has made a lot more progress off its recent lows than Nike. Nike still feels a bit more um, depressed, but you know, if gaps are made to be filled, what are you doing with this one? Well, <laughs> valuation of like oh my god yes let's get arms around this love the name it makes it's cheaper than ups blah 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 of course you know fedex problems are macro in nature they're also fedex induced in nature now to a certain extent they figure some of the stuff out honestly i mean i think you're you're playing it's a 50 50 shot here 
I mean, I could see walking in tomorrow talking about how FedEx missed again, how disappointing it was. Mm -hmm. And I also can see how FedEx, you know, actually surprised people the upside. I don't know. And, and I'm being as honest as I can be. Sometimes you have sort of, you have a sniff about a stock. Other times you're just sort of waiting in no man's land. And I will say, unless you have a view here, I'm sort of waiting in no man's yeah, land. Yeah, I think I'm actually more interested in hearing what this company has to say, you know, from like just kind of like, uh, reading the economic tea leaves, if you will. And you might say, Guy, and you've made this point again and again, that a lot of this company's problems over the last few years has been like really company specific. But to me, I, I don't really have a strong feel for this one. Again, where I'd probably be more inclined to take a shot on the long side, Nike with defined risk. This one seems like no man's land to me. Um, all right, last thing before we get out of here. This is actually really important, especially on a day like today that's making new all-time highs. So it's Thursday, it's market call. We get a preview of John Butter's Earnings Insight blog. It drops every Friday. You can have it to your inbox, people. Um, John is the senior earnings insight analyst over there at Market Call. Guy, you're going to find what's in tomorrow's note pretty interesting here. So he's talking about S&P 500 bottoms up target versus the closing prices over the last 12 months or so. You see the, the slides in there right here. The bottom up target price for the S&P 500 is about 5,600, an 8% price increase over the next 12 months. However, Analysts have overestimated this month end closing price of the index by three to five percent on average over the last 15 years. Mm -hmm. What do you make of that? <laughs> well, I, you know, what do I make of it? The same thing that Carter talks about all the time. I mean, the fact that the market is uh, analysts are typically overshoot to yeah. the upside, all those different things. But again, you know, it when you're trying to, he does great work when you're trying to implement it into a trading strategy that specifically. It makes it very hard. But what it suggests is, again, the overall bullish nature of an industry that gets paid to be bullish overall. Yeah, no, I think that's great. And one of the things we say this all the time about John's work, before we ever met him, before you ever made him a star, Guy well, Adami. He made I, himself a star. He did do that. Um, I've been reading the Earnings Insight um, you know, blog because for me, I love taking these little tidbits and kind of using them as a broader mosaic, how I'm thinking about the macro from kind of you know a top-down sort of thing. And it helps me kind of think about the micro when I kind of try to meet that in the middle there with those two different sets of data points there. This is really interesting to me too, Guy. Okay. So this is the percent of S&P 500 companies citing recession mm -hmm. versus soft landing. This is on the Q4 2023 earnings calls. The consumer discretionary real estate and communication services sectors are expected to see the largest price increases. This goes back to what we were talking about here. Um, and on the uh, on the other hand, the materials in the industrial sectors are expected to see the smallest price increases. That goes back to that other data. But let's go like, like again, thinking about Q4, think yeah. about what the company said. We're getting to the end of Q1. So 46% um, on the uh, recession call and 37 on the soft landing. Kind of interesting stuff there. It, it, yes. It's very interesting stuff. I mean, the fact that it, soft landing is now starting to catch up. I mean, again, people are getting, I don't want to say complacent, but they're clearly not nearly as concerned as they were probably this time last year. And I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. I mean, I can't say, you know, maybe it was t things were too dire last year. And the fact that everybody was looking at recession and talking about that suggested that maybe we're looking at the wrong things. But the level of complacency in a survey like that and then subsequently manifesting itself in a VIX sub 13, again, for me at least, is cause for concern. No doubt about it. All right. You guys know where to find John Butter's Earning Insight Analysis. It drops in your inbox every Friday morning. Uh, you can find it at factset.com. By the way, yes, you can. Uh, newsletter. Yeah. Oh, we got one. I mean, you looked at me like, I mean, yes. It's what we're reading. It's more of the charts that we have. It's some of the show notes. It's also some of the detail and some of the trade ideas. Go to riskversal.com. Sign up for it. It's free. free. It goes right. So you know how well, you still do this. Guy still goes to the mailbox. He still goes to the post office. Yeah. He buys stamps. Well, we he, talk, we talked about that yesterday. We did do. Uh, we, well, what, should show. people don't do that? No, no. So you get it for free in your email box. So yeah. Just go to riskversal.com. You yeah. have it there. Obviously, follow us on the socials. Every morning, our crack team is putting together something that we are looking at that morning on the opening that we're going to talk about during the market call. So go to guy.adami uh, at Instagram, Risk Reversal Media on the Instagram, and Dan's Nathan on Instagram. And you could also, if you're watching us here right now, you're on the YouTube. So, yeah, it's, uh, they have to be so by definition. Hit that button. Make sure. Yeah, our, our YouTube channel is growing each day. Yes, it is. Which is a good thing. So enjoy that, people. But the newsletter, just sign up for it. It's free. Yeah. Like the air.
that right, you so breathe. Listen, and, and By the is, way, yeah. you said something earlier. Um, you said a word earlier that had me hearken back to a concert I attended years ago. Do you remember the word you said? No. I know you don't. I do. You said remedy. Oh. Little Black Crows for Oh, yeah. You. Yeah. I saw, you know, it's funny. I saw the Black Crows a year ago in Arizona at a music fest. And I really liked them when that um, album came out. Remedy was off their second album, to be honest with you. Did I just nail that a little bit? Um, uh, your money, shake uh, your shake money, your money, money maker was their first one. Yeah. I think it came out in 1990. I was in high school, and 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 they had that great um, rendition uh, cover of "Hard to Handle." Okay, and that was really popular. But my take on them, and I saw them probably 30 years ago in concert. Yeah. Last year, they should not be playing. Together they don't like anymore. each other. The Robinson well, brothers the, it can't was stand obvious. each other. They didn't sound good. Yeah. It was not fun. Well, I saw them. They were just came out, and they were the warm up band. If that's even is that a phrase sure. kids use? Yeah. For the uh, opener, Aerosmith. Yeah. Oh, that's pretty cool. So I saw Aerosmith at the Meadowlands. He was like a bear market. Um, what's his name? Who's the lead singer oh. of Aerosmith? Uh, Steven Tyler. Yeah, he's a bear market. Steven Tyler. A little bit. A little bit. I mean, Black Crows. Yeah. Their studio stuff is very good. They had a moment, but you know what's funny that you say that their studio stuff. I love rock and roll. That's a good Joan song. Jet. Okay, but I, I prefer Joan Jett. like the live music of almost every band that I love uh, over the recorded stuff. Interesting. Just saying, like Grateful Dead's a great example of a band. I know you don't care for them. They suck. Well, no, they I, do suck. I love them, but they're they were a band that were great. Yeah. Bill Hawkins, some... Bill Hawkins, Bill Hawkman in the back is giving me the. All right, so let's now, hold it. on a second. Yeah, we got a lot of stuff. I will tell that. you. Yeah. Leonard Skinner, yeah, their studio albums by and large were shitty, except yeah. Street Survivors, yes. which was released on October 17th, 1977. Nice, unbelievable studio yeah. album. Their live work, unbelievable. Skinner was a band live, yeah. The Allman Brothers, very similar, sure. I mean, their studio stuff is great. Led Zeppelin, their studio stuff is unbelievable, yeah. live, not so much. I'm just saying, I'm just putting it out there. The Stones, I don't think, are a great live band. I haven't seen them live since I will tell you, Eagles, not the Eagles, 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 great live band. All right. You want to stop this, I can see. Yeah. We got we we have like two other pods to do today. Yeah, we do. All right. All right. So listen, this has been fun. Tomorrow's Friday, unless something crazy happens. You won't, but you will see us on Monday. All right. And on Monday, we do we do a drop with EY from SoFi on the On a Tape podcast. And then we do, I, I don't know if Carter's with us on Monday. I, don't know, I can't keep track Tuesday. of his schedule. It's back Tuesday. Tuesday. Yeah. So we got a lot going on. Stick around, folks. Check out our podcast, which will drop tomorrow on in the Anate podcast. We also have the Josh Brown Mike Batten it that dropped today. So go check that out. We had Gene lot going on. OK Computer on Wednesday. We're just kind of grinding out here, people. Thanks for being here.